All right, praise the name of the Lord. Friends and families, thank you for coming to 2024 BSTO, April 2024 uh, session of it. Uh, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer, and we are going to get started right away. So, Heavenly Father, we come into your presence right now. Uh, thank you for the gift of life. Uh, thank you for an opportunity to fellowship with one another. And Father, I am asking you, Father, that the eyes of our hearts be opened to understand your ways to understand your lifestyle with which we are going to maintain our freedom. Um, Holy Spirit, I'm asking you for your power and your presence to flow through the atmosphere. Even for those who are going to be watching this presentation at a later date, let your power minister grace, minister mercy to them and their circumstances in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen and amen. Glory to God. Thank you for coming in. This is Biblical Steps to Overcome from Hero Smarts Ministries. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus because the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. That's what Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 talks about. And there is no condemnation, condemnation for us in Christ Jesus because of that scripture. So no, no matter what the devil might have used to tag your Christian testimony, know that there is no condemnation for you. There is a way out of any situation. So we are going to be talking about um, uh, what bad habits are, what negative addictions are. We're going to be using that word, bad habits and ne negative addictions interchangeably. Why we need to come out of those kind of things. The reason people get addicted to start with the path to and the path out of negative addictions all right so what are addictions addictions are going to be enslavement to bad habits um, and the word of god says in romans chapter 6 and verse 16 says don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves you are slaves to the one you obey whether you are slaves to, to sin which leads to death or to obedience which leads to righteousness. Well, this verse of scripture lets us know what enslavement is going to be all about. And that is what disobedience or sin is. And incidentally, there is a dictionary's definition which says something clo closely akin to what Romans chapter 6 and verse 16 is talking about. He says the, the addiction is going to be the state of being compulsively committed to a habit or to a practice or to something that is going to be psychologically or physically habit forming to such an extent that its cessation causes severe trauma. So that sounds to us like there is a, a situation in which people want to get free from something, but they have shackles literally snapping them back to that particular habit. And that's the reason this graphic is on the board. Well, that's what a bad habit is. That's what addictions are. Now, by the grace of God, a lot of us in this ministry, uh, we don't have situations of bad habits and addictions in our lives, but we still have these conversations every, mo every month because we want to steer far away from this kind of situations. How do we do that? Well, with the wisdom of, wisdom of the righteous. But for other people who may be stumbling on this presentation at a later day, if you have certain challenges that are dogging your heels, you really want to get, get free from them. But you find yourself recursively going back into those kind of bad habits and situations well there is hope for you we are going to be talking about some wisdom strategies which we discovered from the pages of the bible through which you can get free so stay on board with us but this is what addictions are per capita this is this is what bad habits are per capita now uh why should we come out of it so um, if you're watching this presentation for the very first time well you may you might you might have resigned yourself to it you know this is going to be the way i'm going to be forever well that's not a good deal because i'm going to share with you certain staggering statistics that will jolt your mind and potentially jolt you into action with regards to wanting to come out of it um do you know that thousands of people die every year because of some kind of a bad habit over 600 billion dollars is wasted or spent every year treating bad habits or addictions 56 percent of divorce cases are caused by bad habits bad habits steals steal people's peace shatter aspirations and dreams and most important the spirit of disobedience in the air causes it and it sends it is sending people to hell 
So it is something that we don't want to play with. We've got to we've got to figure out how to dislodge, how to get out of every bad habit of every addiction by the grace of God. Why? Revelation chapter twenty one and verse eight says, "But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned." to the fiery lake of burning sulfur and this is the second death okay so you see over there all those things are going to be in the categories of bad habits immorality and magic arts and liars and idolatry well we don't want to play with all those kind of things because they are going to send people to hell now we know lots of people really want to come out of it i mean they go through prescription medications they go through therapy they go through all kinds of you know treatments to want to get rid of bad habits but the challenge is bad habits and addictions are spiritual problems and you do you do not try to overcome a spiritual problem physiologically or physically you have gotta understand how to get into a counteracting spiritual strategy to overcome a spiritual problem well why are we saying that well the reason we're saying that is because Ephesians chapter 2 and from verse 1 to verse 2 it says as for you you were dead in your transgressions and sins when in which you used to leave when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom in the air the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient well did you see that there is a spirit behind disobedience based on the evidence of that scripture over there and spiritual forces are much faster they are they have access to more more information than physical forces or than the realm of the natural. So if you're trying to fight a spiritual force physically, you're going to find yourself uh, you, you just at a disadvantage. It's not going to work. That's the reason all these therapy therapies and uh, uh, physical treatments really cannot solve a spiritual problem. Well, we got good news for you because we have a spiritual solution. Glory to God. Somebody type that in for me by the grace of God. The good news is there is a spiritual solution to addictions. And that's what the Bible promises. That's what the Bible identifies for us. So fasten your seatbelts and let us identify that spiritual solution. All right. So why do people get addicted? Entertainment. Roller coaster. Video games, you know, whatever is going to make me feel good. Entertainment. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 from verse 1 to verse 5, there will be terrible times in the last days. And by the way, this particular scripture was written about 2,000 years ago. And as far as they were concerned, they had terrible times in the time of Timothy. But guess what? How much more terrible is the time we're living in right now? If during the time of Paul and Timothy, the world was terrible, can you imagine how terrible it is right now in 2024? <laughs> it is grossly terrible. So people are going to be lovers of, themse lovers of themselves. They are going to be lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiven, slanderous without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Well, that's what is prevalent in this generation and more prevalent in this generation than it was back in the time of Paul. They love pleasure more than they love God. The Bible says they have a form of godliness, but they deny its power, have nothing to do with such people. Well, that's the reason there is so much addictions in this generation. Love for pleasure, which replaces the love for God. We said a few months ago that the love for pleasure and love for God cannot exist in a single person. I haven't said that before, but somebody typed it in. He didn't come out that way a few months ago. Love for pleasure and love for God cannot exist in the same person. In other words, you're going to be a lover of pleasure and you don't love God, you hate God. Or you're going to be a lover of God and you hate pleasure. 
you hate entertainment. Oh, oh. but I want to do something, something mind-numbing sometimes. But well, you can, um, especially if you have guardrails around it. But you're not gonna love it. You want to make sure that you are devoted to God and not devoted to entertainment or pleasure. Also, type that in for me. Love for pleasure cannot exist together with love for God in the same person. Why? Because entertainment is going to lead to hatred for the things of God. Well, that's the reason people get addicted. So entertainment, you know, a little bit of it, you're going to try to fill the void that is inside the human heart. But you realize that you can't fill that void just by entertainment because a little bit of ent entertainment is going to get you uh, a momentary ecstasy. Well, that ecstasy is going to be fleeting, fleeting in its efficacy. So you want to go back and do a little bit more of it. And then you get some little more ecstasy. And then it's fleeting in its efficacy. Then you go back, you want to get more of it. And then and there is, it's not enough. Then you go back and get more of it. And before you know it, people get addicted. So they slide into the slippery crack of entertainment and find themselves in addictions. That's the way he works. But there is a way to get out of it. And now we identified in Titus chapter 3 the way to get out of addictions by understanding the way into it. Titus chapter 3 verse 3. At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. You know, the, the Spirit of God helped us to understand that there is a process to enslavement over here. And it starts with foolishness. Foolishness disobedience, deception, and enslavement. Well, we call that process FDDA, uh, which enslavement is going to be another word for addictions. It's F, which stands for foolishness, disobedience, deception, and addiction. That's the way into it. When people just don't get themselves entangled with the slavery of addictions and bad habits overnight. You know, it's a process. you got to have foolishness, entrenched in your processes, in your way of life, and then that leads to disobedience, and disobedience has associated with a deception, and then there's going to be enslavement as a consequence. Well, that's the, that's the path into it, but thankfully, there is the truth that we can glean and remove from a lie, because we're going to deduct the lie, we're going to get the truth, that's what we need over here. So identify a counteractive spiritual strategy, which we call the RTOW strategy, and that strategy is going to start with R, which is repentance, and it graduates to truth, and then graduates to obedience, and then to wisdom of the righteous. We call it RTOW. So if you're watching this presentation for the very first time, I wanted to take a note of this by the grace of God. And for the guys on the call, uh, please type it in, Path to Addictions, F-D-D-A. And make, make sure you capitalize that word F which is going to be foolishness, D, disobedience, D, deception, and then E or A, which is going to be addictions. That's the way into it. Now, the way out of it, you're going to help me type it into that chat, is going to be equivalent to R-T-O-W. R stands for repentance, T stands for truth, O stands for obedience, and W stands for the wisdom of the righteous. Now, if you're watching us, please make sure you type that in, please, because this is the overarching spiritual strategy that will trump any addictions. Will trump any addiction. And I'm saying that categorically. Oh, I can you be so sure of that? Well, because it's the Word of God. And everything was created by God's Word. So addictions will bow their knees to the order of the spiritual force that the Word of God will generate. Glory to God. Somebody type that in. Addictions will bow their knees to the force that will come out of the Word of God. Bad habits, I don't care what you call it. Bad habits, addictions, sins will bow their knees to the force that will come out from the Word of God. That's the reason we can be so categorical about this. The way out is going to be repentance, truth, obedience, and wisdom by the grace of God. Hallelujah. So let's delve into this, into these milestones a little bit better. So when we're talking about um, FDDA, which is the way in, 
he starts with foolishness and the question is what is foolishness well foolishness is not necessarily sin it just means a life of no structure so when I wake up in the morning there is no strict structure to what I do I just do whatever I feel like doing <laughs> And in the afternoon, well, I feel like do whatever I want to do. And I go to bed when I want to go to bed. I wake up when I want to wake up. I eat whenever I want to eat. Um, I drink whatever, whatever I want to drink. And there are no God rules to whatever I do. Well, that is what foolishness is. Because in the mode of doing, doing things like that, the devil is going to be actively working to make sure that he slides sin into my story. Oh, well, after all, there's no, they don't have any guardrails. You know, just give them a little bit in their circumstances, they're going to fall prey to it. Well, that's foolishness. And unfortunately, that leads to disobedience, which is going to be equivalent to treason and sin. And disobedience has associated with it deception, which deceptions are going to be strongholds of lies and beliefs that try to reinforce the condition of disobedience. And when that reinforcement happens the condition of the person becomes habitual treason right now it becomes addictions that's the way into it we call it FDDA but the way out is the RTOW repentance which is making a u-turn truth overcoming deceptions obedience and wisdom, which will be equivalent to discipleship strategies that we identified through these studies by the grace of God. So let's delve deeper into the way in right now. The way in is the foolishness of a child. The Word of God talked about how in the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 2 from verse 8, the Lord God made all trees, all kinds of trees grow out of the, gar out of the ground. Trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. And in the middle of the garden, there were tree, there were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But what's Adam doing? There is no record in that passage of scripture that Adam was methodically eating from the tree of life or was methodically steering away from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What were they doing? They were just busy playing in the sand and enjoying the beauty of God's creation, you know, and living day in, day out. I don't know how many days they spent doing that before the sneaky snake <laughs> cornered them. Well, that's pretty much like what a child is going to do. Left to themselves, children don't, don't want to do anything really, really serious. What they want to do is to play in the sand all day long, you know, playing with my toys. And, but there's going to be more to life than that. Hallelujah. There is more to life than playing in the dirt. Somebody type that in for me. And unfortunately, most adults are still like that. You know, they, they've really never grown up. <laughs> if you were to, were to snoop into their minds and see the way they were thinking when they were toddlers, and they are going to be in their 50s and 60s right now, see the way they're thinking spiritually, um, it hasn't really changed. At the back of their heart, you know, what they're just thinking of is, what can I do right now to get entertained? You know, what can I do to have some fun? You know, there's really no structure to the way they think. Well, that's the way that we're thinking right from the cradle. And they still keep on thinking that way. Well, that's the reason the devil can slide them into sin. But we're not going to be like that by the grace of God. There is more to life than playing in the dirt. <laughs> Hallelujah. Playing in the dirt is not sin categorically, but if you live your life trying to play in the dirt all day long, looking for another moment to play in the dirt, well, the devil is going to use that opportunity to slide that person into sin. But if people don't grow out of it, disobedience is the corollary of that. The Word of God says, uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And this has happened to all of us. But it's about time right now that we grow up. Hallelujah. Um, disobedience is going to have associated with it deceptions, which are going to be strongholds of lies right now. Mental strongholds of lies. Why? Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13. It says, But encourage one another daily as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. 
So did you see that sin didn't just stop at being sin? It has deceitfulness associated with it, or it has deception associated with it. And that deception or deceitfulness has the potential of hardening the human heart. Hmm. Deceptions harden the human heart. Somebody type that in for me. You see that? Sin leads to deceitfulness or deception. And the purpose of that deception is to harden the heart. What's the meaning of a hard heart? Well, lots of people may not understand what he means, even though maybe intuitively people can't understand it. But a hard heart is a hardened will. It's, it's a will that is difficult to change or to bend. You know, you, you really can't change a course of direction naturally anymore when the will is hardened. Now, that's what deceitfulness of sin is going to cause. It's a stronghold. It's a belief. It's a configuration of your thought processes right now that makes it difficult for the person to change. That's the reason treason is dangerous. Oh, but I thought Jesus would forgive me. Yes, he's going to forgive you. The blood of Jesus is going to cleanse your guilt. But the blood of Jesus does not get rid of the hardness of the will. So this generation needs to understand. So don't play with sin. <laughs> Somebody type that in first by the grace of God. Do not play with treason. It will harden the heart. It will harden the will. It becomes more difficult to change. Ah, do not play with it. Well, that's what deception tries to do. And if people don't understand how to get rid of it, oh, but I, I played with sin right now. Does it mean I'm doomed forever? Well, there is a, a way to walk out of it. We're going to get to that. Uh, but we're just going to try to understand the uh, pathetic situation of sinners. Okay, so <laughs> when they get hardened and they don't know how to get, get rid of it, milestone number four is going to be the situation. And it's, it's, it is pathetic because it's like a whirlpool. So you jump into a whirlpool and you really can't get out. It means it's a pool of water that keeps spinning right around, right around, right around. We're not getting anywhere, just right around, right around. And that's what treason does to people because there is deceitfulness and hardness associated with their wheels right now. That's milestone number four. This is the condition of addictions over here. Oh, but everybody is addicted. Don't you think God's going to going to relax his standard and he's he's just going to turn a blind blind high to it and say well it doesn't really matter no 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 god is not going to relax his standard just because this generation can get it right no <laughs> let god be true and everybody else a liar somebody type that in for me god's we may resign ourselves to addictions but god is not resigning to addictions somebody type that in for me so uh, everybody else in the world may be going to hell. You make up your mind. I'm not going to hell with everybody else in the world. They may all be addicted. That's their problem. I'm, I'm doing something else with my story. And if God finds one person like that on the earth, he is going to tighten the news on the rest of us. Come on now. No, the father is not going to re resign himself to addictions. you got to come out of it. The father does not resign himself to addictions, and neither should you. Somebody type that in by the grace of God. So how do we come out of it right now since uh, this situation is so pathetic? Well, the way out is going to be RTOW, and it starts with repentance, which is what you're doing right now. If you stayed for the uh, next, for the past 20 minutes listening to us, watching this presentation for the very first time, uh, congratulations. It means that you are over here right now. You are in milestone positive one. You want to repent. And what is repentance? Repentance is a change of the mind, firstly a change of the will, that leads to a change of the mind, that leads to a change of conduct. Hallelujah. Somebody type that in, I don't think I said it like that before. Repentance is a change of the will, which leads to a change of the mind, which leads to a change in conduct. And all those three things have to be there for it to be called repentance. If I say, well, I repent, I change my will, I change my mind, but I'm still acting like I acted yesterday, I've not truly repented. No, repent, you got to change your actions as well. 
Oh, well, how do we do that? Well, the Word of God says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we uh, confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hebrews chapter 9, if the blood of bulls and goats could purge the flesh of those who offered it, how much more shall the blood of Christ purge my conscience from dead works so I can serve the living God? Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 13. He who covers his sins shall not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes shall obtain mercy. Well, these three scriptures over there, that's how to repent. Somebody type that in for us, please. How to repent. Turn to 1 John chapter 1 verse 9. Hebrews chapter 9 from verse 13 to 14. Proverbs chapter 28 verse 13. And you just say, Father, I'm sorry. I realize that this particular bad habit is a sin, is an addiction. It's killing me and it's taking me to hell. Please forgive me. And I ask you to cleanse my conscience from this dead work. I receive my forgiveness by faith and I determine to walk away from it. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, you pray that prayer in less than 30 seconds, you are forgiven. The blood of Jesus has gone to action to purge your conscience from, from dead works right now. You're not going to feel guilt anymore if you do, do it by faith. It takes less than 30 seconds to do it, and actually, that is my recommendation. So you're coming through these teachings. We want to make sure that you do not stay past 30 seconds in treason. <laughs> because if I stay past 30 seconds in treason and I die in that mode, I'm going to go to hell. Because the highest of the Lord are too holy to behold iniquity. Let nobody fool you. Simply mouthing Jesus is not going to take you to heaven. The Father's eyes are too holy to behold iniquity. He can Iniquity can't stand in God's heaven. It's just, you know, take that right now as the gospel truth. And anytime there's guilt in your heart about something, don't, don't let it go past 30 seconds. Because if you were to die in that mode, ooh, God forbid. So that's what we talk about, that this is repentance in here, making a U-turn. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. Turn, make a U-turn, change your will, change your mind, change your actions. That's what repentance is. Hallelujah. How many people can do it right now by the grace of God? I believe you're saying yes and yes and yes. That's how to repent. It's 30, a 30 second process. Oh, but I repented last week, but I find myself still doing something else like that again. Well, that's the reason for this milestone. Milestone number two is going to be truth. The reason you find yourself snapping back into the errors of your past is because you did not graduate to the truth milestone. Because, you know, we, we talked about in the previous slide that sin is going to have associated with it deception, right? So that deception is going to still be, be there in the will until you unearth it. It's going to be there as a stronghold. It's going to be there as the hardness of the human heart, which has the potential of snapping you back into the sins of the past. Well, what do you want to do? John chapter 8 and verse 32. 32. He says, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So after I have repented, I've got to make sure I graduate right now to identify truth nuggets that will cancel the lies that I believe. That's the reason for this mile, milestone over there. Milestone number two is called truth. So we're walking through the RTOW strategy right now. We've come past repentance. We've come past repentance. We are right now at the truth milestone. So what is truth? Well, there is another chart over here that talks about what truth is going to be all about, helping us to identify it. Truth is going to be equivalent to lies minus distortion. Because a lie is a distorted form of truth to start with. How do we know that? You look at what the devil told Eve uh, during the fall in the book of Genesis. The devil told Eve that, well, if you guys eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you are going to become like God. And if we take a look at that, 
there is a truth in what the devil said, but there's a there's a distortion in, in it as well. Why? Because the father, when he was issuing his judgment on Eve and Adam, he said, the man has now become like one of us, which kind of you know validates what the devil said. He said, yeah, when you eat, you're going to be like God. Correct. So eating that made them to be like God sounds like the truth, but the distortion in it is the process of becoming like God, as far as knowledge was concerned, is distorted. Hmm. Somebody type that in. I don't know if y'all can catch a couple of nuggets from there. <laughs> so the devil said, when you eat the fruit, you're going to be like God. God's just trying to hide something away from you guys. You know, he, he doesn't want you to be like him. Well, as far as knowledge was concerned, they were not like God, correct? But as far as nature was concerned, they were like God. And the appropriate process to grow in knowledge, to know good and evil without necessarily partaking of evil, was not to commit evil and to do evil. That's the distortion in it. So the devil tricked them to believe in that if you want to know good and evil, you got to do evil. But that's a lie. The way you know good and evil is to be eating from the tree of life. Now that's the truth in there. So granted, Adam and Eve were a little bit deficient in their knowledge uh, in comparison to God. That's okay, but that's not going to be like that forever. And besides, God gave them the implicit instruction to be eating from the tree of life, which they neglected which if they had been eating from the tree of life, they would have known good and evil without necessarily doing evil. So if you remove that distortion away from that lie statement, you can retrieve the truth, which in that situation would have been God wants us to be like him as far as knowledge of good and evil was concerned, but not by doing evil, rather by eating from the tree of life. And that's the truth. Now, I made that point to let you know that all lies are going to be like that. All lies are going to have truth and distortions in them. And now, this chart is trying to, to help us to methodically identify lie statements embedded in truths. And when you identify lie statements, the distortion of lies or lie distortions inside truths, the challenge is to remove the distortions from the lies, and then you are going to retrieve the truth. And practically, we're going to identify certain lie nuggets or lie statements, which the truth nuggets of the Word of God will help us to get rid of. For example, simply calling Jesus Lord is going to take him to heaven. It sounds like the gospel truth. Lots of people believe that in this generation. Well, there's a distortion in that. And that distortion is the word simply over here. Huh? Simply calling Jesus Lord is going to take him to heaven. So that word simply over here makes this statement a lie. Why? Because he goes crosswise to the words of the Master himself. Master, the Master himself in Matthew chapter 7. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, or who simply calls me Lord, Lord, will go to heaven, but only those who live to please my Father. So, the word simply is, not, is going to be inappropriate to create some gospel cliche like this and billions of people millions and billions of people believe this lie statement over here it's a lie well that's the reason they can't get rid of sin they believe a lie but if i were to remove the word simply and i believe <laughs> my gospel truth right now calling jesus lord and leaving the place to father is going to take me to heaven Oh, the devil doesn't have any foothold right now to drag me down the scene. But if I don't, he's going to call, come to me and say, well, come on, you still call Jesus Lord and you're going to heaven. I mean, it doesn't matter if you have a little bit of, you know, uh, treason over there. After all, nobody knows it. It's, it's just in your heart, in your mind. You know, don't worry about it. And if I don't have the truth of the word of God believed firmly, I'm going to fall for it. But thank, thankfully, by the grace of God, these sessions are going to unearth the distortions in our hearts, identify the truth of the Word of God so we can be free. Luke chapter 6. What's the point of calling me Lord, Lord, 
and you wouldn't do what I've told you to do. That's what Jesus said over there. So those are going to be truth statements with which we can remove and eliminate distortions of the enemy. Another example is going to be t tests and trials will last forever. That's what the devil tries to tell people anytime they've fallen multiple times over. No. Or during a time of pressure. Well, this trial is going to last forever. No, you can't, you, can't, you can't get out of it. There is no way out. But the Bible says that there is patience in you if you are born again especially. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, temperance. Patience is inside the recreated human spirit. And with the patience inside the recreated human spirit, we can outlast any test, any trials by the grace of God. Another lie yielding to the pressure of the enemy will make it stop. Oh man, this addiction is just trying to kill me. The devil doesn't leave my mind. He keeps on telling me, well, go ahead and do this. Go ahead and do this. It seems like I'm going to die. Well, that's a lie to start with. You're not going to die. The way you resist, the way you overcome is to resist and overcome that pressure. Because if you yield to the pressure right now momentarily, uh, two weeks down the road, a month down the road, well, the pressure is going to get bigger in front of you. And then you're going to yield to it. You get momentary relief. But then a few few months down the road, it becomes bigger. So it doesn't work. Yielding to pressure is equivalent to bigger pressure. Do not bend. Do not bow. You will not burn. Some of the time, that ain't by the grace of God. The way to get rid of, of the pressure is to resist it. Submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee away from you. James chapter 4 in verse 7. Somebody type that in for us. Yielding to the pressure is equivalent to bigger pressure. So do not bend, do not burn, and you will overcome. Hallelujah. The Word of God says there is no peace for the wicked. In Isaiah chapter 48 and verse 22. So when I yield to pressure, I just mortgage my peace to the devil. I transferred my peace over to the devil like that. And it's going to come back a few days, a few years down the road to keep dogging my heels with it. Another lie is the blood of Jesus will completely undo the effects of a past misdeed. Well, that sounds like another gospel cliche. Come on, I just plead the blood over it. Well, the blood has its place, and the place of the blood is documented in Hebrews chapter 9. He says, if the blood of bulls and goats could purge the flesh of those who offered it, how much more shall, much more shall the blood of Christ purge your conscience so you can serve the living God? Did you see the blood of Jesus has a specific task? <laughs> and the task is to purge my conscience. Turn to Hebrews chapter 9 from verse 13 to 14 if you're watching right now. Somebody type that in, the task of the blood is the cleansing of the conscience, not the removal of afflictions in the circumstances. No, the blood wouldn't do that for you. It's not even going to soften your will. The blood wouldn't do that for you. So how do you do that? How do you overcome the afflictions in your story? How do you soften the will? How do you remove the, the hardness in the will? Well, the way you do that is to repeat the test and pass it in flying colors. Why? Because the Bible says that your obedience has to be complete before you can punish disobedience. It says over there that those who through consistency and obeying will get the reward of life to make their bodies immortal. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Well, to get back that glory, i got to get rid of sin. James chapter 1 and verse 27. Blessed are those who endure tests and trials, because when they stood the test of time, they will obtain the crown of life, which God has promised to give those who love Him. All these are scriptures that prove that obedience is important so that we can retrieve our glory. Glory to God, somebody type that in. Obedience is important so you can retrieve your glory. Oh, hallelujah. So this is the truth. And now the chart on the board right now is not necessarily exhaustive. There are going to be additional truth nuggets which the Holy Spirit can bring to your mind to cancel the lies that are lurking in secret places of your heart. Hmm. So write it down. To cancel the lies that are lurking in the secret places of my heart, I need the truth of the Holy Spirit.
Oh, how do you know I have lies in the secret places of my heart? Well, I don't know, and I don't care. <laughs> but I gotta let you know that as long as you are in this planet, there is somebody called the father of lies. And if you don't do anything to counteract his uh, products, the product of the father of lies is gonna be lies. You don't do something, you do not have a spiritual strategy to counteract the product of the father of lies, you're gonna have lies in the secret places of your heart. <laughs> That's just the gospel truth. <laughs> You want to type it in for me. If I don't do something to counteract the product of the father of lies, I am going to have lies in the secret places of my heart. And those lies, they're like time bombs. I mean, they're getting ready for the circumstance on the outside to be right. And then you're going to see the beast coming out of me. And you're going to wonder, wow, how can I ever do such a thing? How can I ever think like this? How can I ever say this? <laughs> the beast has been in your mind all the while. It's been actually in your belief system all the while. You just didn't do anything with it. It was lying there dormantly. Well, that's the reason this exercise is going to be important. you got to make sure that you go to the Holy Spirit every day asking for truth. As the Holy Spirit can see those secret lies and those secret belief, beliefs in your heart, and He's going to be shining the truth of His Word over there on a regular basis. Hey, don't believe that lie. Don't, don't think like that. That's not correct. This scripture over here has been misinterpreted. No, this is the appropriate perspective. Why? Because you're giving the Holy Spirit a legal basis to do that right now. So the chart we have on the board is not necessarily exhaustive. It means it doesn't capture all the lies that may be lurking in the secret places of people's hearts, but at least it gives you a framework that you can work with to understand how to identify the truth, what to do to cancel a lie. But the honest is still on you to go to the Holy Spirit and ask the Holy Spirit every day, Father, please teach me your ways. And that's the reason for these scriptures over here. Proverbs chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 1, Exodus chapter 33. You go to the Holy Spirit every day. You say, Lord, open my eyes today. Give me the truth of your word, which are going to cancel the lies that are lurking in the secret places of my heart. Holy Spirit, open my eyes. If that's all you can say right now for five minutes, well, that's fine. In the name of Jesus, the Holy Spirit is going to hear that prayer. He's going to start connecting scriptures to you, getting circumstances organized and arranged so you can see the truth of the Word of God. And as you graduate and you grow with us in some of these instructions, you're going to pray in the Spirit about it. We call it praying for revelation knowledge every day. You pray in the Spirit about it, God gives you even deeper truths. And in the atmosphere of truth, the Father of lies has no foothold. Glory to God. Somebody type that in for me. In the atmosphere of the truth of the Holy Spirit in my heart, the father of lies has no foothold in my story. Hallelujah. So this is milestone number two, really important. So please and please take a few of these points to heart. Um, and then with the ammunition of the truth of the word of God in my heart right now, guess what? We're going to go right now to milestone number three, which is obedience. So God knows that I have been told the truth. Well, God's going to arrange circumstances to give me an opportunity right now to obey the word. And when the circumstances present themselves to me in the moment of the pressure of the circumstances, what I need to be asking God for right now is mercy and grace. To be faithful. Why? Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. Let us then approach God's throne of favor with faith so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So your time of need is going to be that time of temptation. It's going to be that time when the pressure is on you to do something uh, habitually bad. And you understand, well, I don't want to do this thing. Well, Ask for grace. Father, please give me grace. Give me mercy. Have mercy on me. When you ask like that, the Father is going to give you grace, which is a manifestation of strength for you on the inside. 
Uh, what about mercy? God's going to start working your circumstances to make the circumstances not uh, favorable to sin. Something is going to happen to the electric bulb. you got to go ahead and change your bulb. Or something is going to happen to the kitchen area. you got to go ahead and fix a meal for your family. Uh, somebody's going to call you. Or it's going to start raining on, on the outside. Something like that is going to work on the in the circumstances. That's mercy. To take your mind away from it. And then before long, with a combination of grace and mercy, you're going to be like, well, I can beat this thing. And the Holy Spirit is going to flash back into your memory the truth that you had stored up before in milestone number two. But all these things are going to work because I ask during my time of pressure. Well, that's what Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16 is talking about. And then the more I obey during my time of pressure, the easier it is to obey subsequently. And it's going to get into a situation that I obey becomes easy. I obey becomes easy. I become, And then you get trained right now in obedience. It's pretty much what happens to a dog. And that's the reason we have a picture of a dog over there. You train the dog to be submissive. You, you beat it off. You do all kinds of things to it. <laughs> so you listen to me, buddy, when I'm talking to you. Well, the same thing you got to do with your body right now. The same thing you got to do with your mind. The same thing you have to do with your will. You train your members to be obedient using grace and mercy during the time of pressure. Glory to God. Somebody type that in. Train your members. Train your members to be obedient using grace and mercy during the time of pressure. Hallelujah. And then it becomes easier and easier and easier. Hallelujah. That's the way to come out of it. But we're not even going to stop at the milestone of obedience right now. We're going to graduate right now to the milestone that we call wisdom. And in this particular milestone, by the grace of God, you're going to be remotely far from anything related to addictions or treasons or sins or anything like that. Why? Because you're walking right now in the wisdom of the righteous. Luke chapter 1 and verse 17, it says, Turn the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So that you see that there is going to be wisdom associated with being the righteous. You want to maintain a right standard relationship with God? you got to be wise. Hallelujah. <laughs> Somebody type that in. You want to maintain a right standing relationship with God? You have to be wise. Oh, so how do I get that wisdom then? Well, thankfully, somebody's gone before us who had the testimony of maintaining the right standard relationship with God. He's what people call Jesus, whom we call Yahushua. And incidentally, he gives us an invitation to come learn from his wisdom. He says, come and learn of me. Learn from me, and I will give you rest. Come take my yoke upon you. Learn from my wisdom strategies and from my discipline. And you're going to get rest for your soul. But you got to come and learn from Jesus. You gotta come and learn from Yeshua, Yahushua, whatever name your culture calls the reason Savior of I, learn from the Master. Oh, how do I learn from the Master then? Well, you can read your Bible, especially in the Gospels. You're gonna read in between the lines what are certain habits that Jesus had when he was walking on the earth. The habit of going out to pray early in the morning or praying anytime. He's had an, a heated debate. Just going to go ahead and pray and recharge himself. Well, oh, how do I find those kind of wisdom strategies? Well, that's the reason you have the HFODP in the 21st century. So there are some people who have gone ahead of you to comb through the Bible to identify what we call the wisdom of the righteous. And we've packaged everything together in what we call Hero Smart Online Discipleship Program. It's a collection of wisdom strategies that we got from the master. And yours is just to take it. You don't necessarily have to go through the page of the Bible to identify this wisdom. No, it's already available for you. Really? Correct. It is available for you. How do I access the ODP then? Well, you're going to go to youtube.com slash hero smart. You don't need to pay anything for it. Just type that into your browser youtube.com slash heroes mart you click on that link or you type it in like that it's going to open a page up for you 
where you can access the ODP by yourself. Jesus Christ came to set God's people free from sin, but lots of God's people still struggle with sin and fall into scandals. How? It's right there. And then you're going to go to something called the playlist. You're going to go to the playlist over there. You're going to see uh, online discipleship program for 2024, for 2023, 2022. Uh, you're gonna see over here 2021 now we've been doing this for a few years right now so you're welcome just to use anyone you're gonna see all these playlists over there playlist so you click on anyone you want to want to watch so for example you click on the 2024 online stop you start to play in front of you right now and actually there's even a better way to connect with the ODP and all you need to do is to go to the website because we know there may be distractions on YouTube for, for people who are not really disciplined. But anyway, you go to the website, you type in heroesmart.com, and then you are going to go to church at Heroes Mart from the menu. Scroll down to the bottom, you're going to see watch sermons. And then you're going to click on the week you want to click on. Maybe week number one, for example, you're going to see the sermon is going to come in front of you, and you have it. That's it right in front of you. And over here, the beauty of coming through the website is you get a chance right now to use the study notes. The study notes are going to be here for you to study along with the messages. And then you get a chance as well to do what we call hashtag church at Hero Smart, which are going to be really powerful nuggets that we put together uh, on Facebook. You click on hashtag church at Hero Smart. Okay, well, this person doesn't have a Facebook account just yet. But you do that. You're going to see messages here, study notes for you to study along with us. And you run through week number one, week number two, week number three, and up until week number 52. You are going to see these messages over here that will teach you about the wisdom of the righteous. This is what we call the HMODP. And you walk through this wisdom of the righteous day in, day out. You are going to be free and far from anything remotely close to addictions. You're going to be in the wisdom strategies right now. In the wisdom milestone by the grace of God right now, RTOW, this is where we are by the grace of God. Far from foolishness, far from disobedience, far from deception, and far from addictions by the grace of God. This is biblical steps to overcome bad habits. Uh, the April 2024 session is what we have walked through, and I believe you got something from it. If you have questions, you're welcome to send us questions. Send us prayer requests to info at heroesmart.com. We'll be more than happy to stand in faith with you because Jesus came to set his people free from sins. You have no business struggling with bad habits. I have no business struggling with it. We are here for you. We are your brothers and sisters in the Lord. Let's do life together. Did you get something from it? I sure hope so. Let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another wonderful opportunity to share the word with your precious people all over the world. My Father, as they are coming through this content, O oh Lord, by your grace and mercy, I'm asking you for grace in their hearts. The grace that's going to teach them to say no to ungodliness. That will help them to steer far and free away from sin and so that they can leave us worthy vessels for you. I pray mercy all over their circumstances, mercy that will make the circumstances favorable for obedience, to make it easy for them to live to please God, and to overcome the challenges in their stories. Satan, I take authority over you. You will have no power over these precious people. I command you to desist in your operations right now in the name of Jesus. Set them free. Be with them. And give them peace, joy, and righteousness in the Holy Spirit in the name of Yahushua. Amen. Glory to God, friends and families. Thank you for joining with us. This is Biblical Steps to Overcome from Hero Smart. And until next time, God loves you and so do we. Yahushua is Lord. Stay blessed. Hallelujah.